I'm surrounded by rolling hills, beautiful grassland, and livestock of just about every variety. You'd think that I was in Xinjiang or Inner Mongolia, but, well, I'm not. I'm in Gannan, the southern part of Gansu, home to the Tibetan ethnic minority. Welcome to Travelog, I'm Michelle Lin. Gannan Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture is located in the southwestern part of Gansu province. Covering an area of 45,000 square kilometers, it has a population that is 51% Tibetan, 41% Han Chinese, and other ethnic groups. Since the Tibetan ethnic minority group makes up the majority of the population here, you'll find a lot of Tibetan influences. All in all, it's a good place to visit to get a taste of Tibetan culture without having to endure the high altitudes of Tibet itself. But that said, it's still pretty high up here. On average, it's about 3,000 meters above sea level. Most people feel a shortness of breath or experience some dizziness, but it usually passes in a day or two. The local opinion, though, is that there's no such thing as altitude sickness. People just get anxious when they hear about it, and that's what makes them sick. Either way, do take the necessary precautions. You know, better safe than sorry. There are several ways of getting to Ganan. We flew from Beijing to Langzhou, the capital of Gansu province, before driving to the first stop on our journey, Shahe County. Shahe gets its name from the Dashia River, a tributary of the Yellow River. It's a rural, mountainous area where the locals rely on a pastoral existence to sustain their livelihood. On the drive over, we pass many herds of yaks and other livestock. Now, I'd never seen a yak till then, but I certainly got my fill during the four-hour drive. Shahe is a small town bordering Qinghai province. This once rural area has recently become a tourist destination, mostly attracting backpackers and independent travelers. Most of them come to visit the Labram Monastery, one of the largest and most famous Tibetan Buddhist monasteries outside of Tibet itself. It's a huge place that dominates the northern area of Shaha. The monastery is one of the six great monasteries of the Gelug, or Yellow Hat School of Tibetan Buddhism. In fact, it was the last of the six schools to be built. Founded in 1709 by Nagawan Sundru, the first reincarnated Buddhist teacher, Labrang was one of the largest monistic universities in the Buddhist world. In its heyday, it was home to several thousand monks spread across six colleges. Today, however, there are only about 500 monks studying here. At Tibetan monasteries, you'll find these prayer wheels. And here at the Labra Monastery, as early as 3 or 4 in the morning, you'll find people here going around this compound in a clockwise motion, spinning these wheels. And there are about 1,500 of them here. And when they spin these wheels, They'll be praying for, you know, goodwill and good towards humanity and mankind. There's something almost hypnotic about watching these devout Buddhists turn wheel after wheel while they pray. A few of them did look up to watch us at work, but they quickly lost interest and resumed their prayers. I almost felt guilty for breaking their concentration, even though it was only for a moment. But I soon realized we were just a minor distraction. Their belief was far too powerful. It takes more than just habit and determination to come here every day, walk the compound, and turn the 1,500 prayer wheels. I think it takes genuine spiritual devotion, something I find truly admirable. Labra Monastery is one of the largest Tibetan Buddhist monasteries in the world and it has the most extensive collection of Buddhist scriptures of all of them. The six colleges at the Labra Monastery are the Sutra and Debate College, also known as the Philosophy College, the Medical College, the Upper and Lower Tantra Colleges, the Kalachakra College, and the Havira College. Monks are either assigned to a college or they choose one for themselves, according to their special interests. Of course, it's better if they choose since their study can last an entire lifetime.
And how long do monks usually study for? I mean, actually, are there different sections? Or? Yeah, actually, in here are different six colleges, you know, different texts, and uh, mm -hmm. study for years, you know. Yeah. And uh, most of probably six and, and uh, how to say, the college and the, the philosophy, mm -hmm. you know, about here, most monks and I study philosophy. The philosophy has mm -hmm. 13 classes, one yeah. class for one year. And yeah, how many the, years do they have? How many years are there? Yeah, many, yeah, many, many years. But I want to do, I want to finish in the classes, the monks okay. agree to the, take the exam to, the name is called the uh, Dorumbas and Aramjum, but the highest positions, you know. That's the highest level? Yeah, yeah highest level. And how, how long would it take to get to the highest level? Uh, I think this one is, uh, Almost uh, 25 and 30 years they're studying. That's a lifetime yeah, of yeah. Yeah, studying. Yeah, it's a month, oh. just a whole life to study. That's yeah. kind of do that. Yeah. Uh, can't pass that exam. You yeah. know, it's too, too, too difficult. Mm -hmm. Just uh, here, just uh, you know, mm, philosophy yeah. has uh, about 700 marks. study philosophy just one two marks one year to do that. Right. Yeah, can pass that exam. You know. Huh. Do you see those rooms up there in the mountains? They're called Chikam. And every year on special days, monks below the age of 25 from the Tantra College go there to pray and to read their Buddhist scriptures and, well, meditate. And they'll go basically before uh, sunrise, they'll have a little bit of lunch at noon, and then they'll go home again at sunset and repeat that. Every day the monks will have morning and afternoon classes. In each of the six colleges there are 13 levels of education. Now once a student reaches the 12th level, he takes part in one of the two open debates that are held annually. At the end of it, only one person will go on to the 13th level, that is, after considerable questioning and scrutiny by his fellow students and judges. Sometimes, if the judges aren't convinced, no one will be deemed to have passed the debate. But, see, here's the catch. A monk can only undergo this examination once in his lifetime, so anyone who participates and doesn't pass has to remain at the 12th level or restart their education from scratch again at another college. If you thought school exams were difficult, try dedicating an entire lifetime of study for just one opportunity. Every morning at around 11, tourists can come to the Labra Monastery to listen to the afternoon prayers. But the only people allowed inside those halls are monks and selected donors for the day. So you'll see all the tourists up there congregated by the hall outside just listening to like the prayers. One thing you have to remember though is when you go, no cameras are allowed. So don't try to sneak any photos in. Tibetan people are extremely devout and will make regular visits to the monastery to pray for their loved ones. One such occasion is when a relative leaves home. The entire family will visit the monastery bringing with them yak butter for lighting candles and long pieces of silk called hada to pray for a safe journey. Apparently, you need to present your hadas to the monastery before you pay homage before the statues of the Buddha, because presenting a hada, be it to a monastery or as a welcoming gift to a guest, is a sign of purity, respect, and loyalty. At the Labra Monastery, you'll find a special room dedicated to one of the most unique forms of Tibetan art, yak butter sculptures. Obviously, these models can only be made during winter when the butter is solid. Every year, the six colleges compete to make a yak butter sculpture that will be put on display. Because of its delicate nature, the sculpture usually only lasts about six months. When it gets too hot, the yak butter will be allowed to melt so that it can be used again in next year's competition.
Aside from yak butter sculptures, another well-known art form, perhaps the most famous in Tibetan culture, is the tanka. This is a painting or embroidered banner depicting Tibetan Buddhist iconography, which you'll find hanging at monasteries and family altars. It's an ancient art form dating back to the late 13th century. Nowadays, even a small tanka can cost tens of thousands of RMB, and the value comes from the work put into the painting. Everything is handmade, from the canvas to the paints. The canvas is made from cotton or silk, with each layer tempered with an herb and blue solution. And the paints on their own are worth quite a pretty penny because they're made of precious stones and gold that have been grinded up. I'd heard of tankas before, but I had yet to see one, so it was a good thing that I didn't have to go far, because right next door to the Labrang Monastery is a tanka art center run by a Tibetan monk. <音>这样的一个画也是一个藏民族的一个怎么说呢一个传统的一个特色的这样的一个画嗯你想记得的话就是国画油画唐卡三个是世界上很有名的嗯完成一个唐卡的话自自从大学的话嗯无论无论